other end. This morning, this year, we are going to be talking about the gospel. But well, what is the gospel? One, it is God's word, and it is the good news declared of Jesus, and it gives us hope. Brother Matt will be preaching in the in First Corinthians fifth chapter fifteen verses one through four. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again according to the scripture. Let's have a prayer for this year's renewal. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We pray that we will accept the truth and that Brother Matt has to say and everyone else who is going to preach today, Lord. And we pray that we will not let any temptations come in our minds, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And one of the stated objectives of these renewals is to clarify the content and the nature of the gospel. And we have in past years at these renewals focused on various aspects of the message of the gospel. We've talked about its implications, its preeminence, its focus, and its drive. Yet in all of these things that we have spoken of, these many hours of preaching and teaching that we have sat through and this, these discussions that we have had, we confess that we have not yet come close to exhausting this message. As we have grown together in our comprehension of it, not one portion of it has become irrelevant. The message hasn't aged with us. Our continual consideration and exposition of it has not made it a routine thing. Our, our, our continual... Uh, in our continual speaking of this has not become made this become a common thing it is still a profound thing because this year as we continue in our this quest to further clarify the gospel we're going to be rehearsing these references to the message that are contained in the epistles now i want to start our consideration by asking this question why have we made such a thing our aim to focus on the gospel of jesus christ well, to put it simply, we do so because we want to. People work this way, right? I think people are, some people are kind of fundamentally dishonest when they say things. People do what they want to do. They really do. So when we spend all this time here speaking of this to one another, we, we, we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and we cannot but speak of the things that we've seen and heard. We confessed openly and unashamedly that this gospel is the most good news of all. That uh, as And after all, as with, is with any news, if what has happened is not proclaimed, then it not, doesn't do anybody any good at all. So we see the importance of this. We recognize that this is a message which is sorely needed to be heard, especially today. That this news is the single most important message for every man in the earth to hear in his lifetime. It is a message of revival. It's a message of restoration and healing. It's a message of forgiveness, of redemption, of a available divine favor and blessing. It testifies of a God of mercy who provides salvation. It, it, it declares a savior of man. It outlines a provision of grace and holds out good hope and everlasting consolation to come. And as such, it is a message that has great power within itself. It is, as the scripture testifies, the power of God unto salvation. There is no other message that can motivate and captivate the hearts of my, and minds of men like this message can. Amen. We come to this time focusing our attention on this message because we recognize that the preaching of the gospel ought never to be neglected because it is always good news to anyone who hears it. It is in itself attractive, productive, potent, and convincing. It doesn't need to be modified or added to by men. 
There is really no prosperity gospel. There is no social gospel. There is no seeker-friendly gospel. There's no gospel for the old, gospel for the young, gospel for the men and the women. If you have to add an adjective to your gospel, then it ceases to be the gospel. It is not a gospel of many messages. It's not a gospel of many agendas. It is the gospel that testifies of the man, Christ Jesus. And as such, it reaches to all nationalities, all races, all ages. It's not bound by gender or social status. It is equally able to affect the heart of a king as it is the heart of a beggar because it testifies of a provision which meets the most basic need of all mankind. It is always relevant and ever needful because it addresses man's need for righteousness, his need for God. Now, whether it is heard by a newborn believer, a steadfast saint in the midst of opposition and trial, or a spiritually mature, aged saint nearing the end of their race, the good news of the gospel contains implications that has bearings upon every season of the believer's experience in this world. So that being said, it's in this context that I'll be speaking concerning the gospel that is preached to the church. This is... uh, We've heard many foolish things said about this type of thing in our day. That the, the gospel is only for the sinners. Well, I think the, the, uh, Brother Paul has something else to say about this. The text I'm assigned this morning is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. He, he gives him this reminder. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Now, to some people, that might sound kind of like a foreign thing. But the the apostle is in our text is declaring to these brethren the nature of this gospel which he had delivered to them. So they've heard this before. This gospel is the one which they have a continual need to be reminded of. From the very start, we notice here that the apostle does not assume or expect that they gained all the benefit they could from hearing it in the first place. In fact, judging from the nature of the t- and the tone of the epistle at this point, he was declaring this, much, this message to them as a much-needed reminder in light of some circumstances that they currently found themselves in. The reason why they were in these circumstances is because they had forgotten this message that he preached unto them. They had forgotten what they had already believed. Now, the very nature of the good news which the gospel declares involves a continual involvement. It involves a continual consideration of these things. This salvation is, after all, not merely something which we receive and enjoy. It is a call to involvement. It is a call to involvement and purpose and a divine work. We are made alive so that we may, in and according to that life, live. It only makes sense. The apostle begins also by calling to the remembrance that their reception of this gospel that was preached unto them, this is what he wants to remind them, that you received it. Now the provision of salvation which has been provided for us in Christ Jesus is in its by, by its very nature a conditional one in that it requires that you receive it. It's been provided. The sins have been paid for for all men. But this is not going to benefit all men. It is good to be reminded of the time when you came face to face with the gospel. I believe that it's very beneficial to think back upon what happened in you when you first believed, when you first received this message. That is the point at which you became a recipient in this inheritance. This is when it was the good news for you. Now, what is, it, what is it about the message of the gospel that makes it appealing to you? I thought about that in my own self. When you first accepted it and received it as the very truth, when you first believed upon the Christ of whom it testifies, why was it worth abandoning all other pursuits that you were in quest of? Simp- to put it simply, because it was good news. It was I know know within myself, when I recognized my failure, when I saw, really began to see the corruption of my nature, I knew the history of my transgression. I began to feel the weight of my sin. 
I knew somewhat of what the consequences were of my filthiness before a holy and righteous God. I remember the burden of that knowledge, the, the despair of having to live with this hanging over my head. I can, I can fellowship with Pilgrim and, and the Pilgrim's Progress when, when, when he, this burden was, was, finally, was first made known to him when he read that book and he realized what a burden he was strapped with. So when the word came to me at that time, testifying of Jesus, that in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, that God has set forth him to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. When I heard that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, that was good news, brethren. That was good news. At that time, within the context of my sin and my shame, it seemed almost absurd to me to do anything else but to flee to Christ. So I, I, was, I was reminded as I was thinking about this of the words of the hymn writer. It was, it's so good. He says, mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There was, like, there was a multiplication that happened there. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. See, there was clarity there. There was direction. There was a real sense of determination, a strong confidence in believing at that point in time. Well, this is what the, 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 the apostles is calling these brethren to remember, the power and the clarity which was accompanied by their initial uh, acceptance and reception of this gospel which was preached. So as he, he reminds him of this, he continues to tell him of this gospel, that this gospel that you received, that saved you initially, is also the means wherein you stand, and by which also you are saved. So that the message which brought us unto the good news of a Savior, which we believed, is the same message that keeps us. It does not need, nothing else needs to be preached. The gospel continues to be good news to the saint because it is, it is that very confidence by which we enter that we rely on to continue in the faith. In fact, it's designed to be so. The, the, the Lord has designed it this way because we must by necessity be sustained and upheld to combat the world, the flesh, and the devil with which we must contend in this world. In the third chapter of Hebrews, he said it this way, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. Amen. See, it's not assumed, ever assumed by the apostle that having received the gospel, these believers will continue to walk according to it. Amen. This is something which must be entered into with much effort, with much intention. It requires perseverance, determination. Actually, it demands of you things that you are not able to accomplish. It demands that you rely upon divine resources to accomplish it. it by necessity, it calls you up higher to operate according to divine resources. It teaches you how to rely upon His strength to continue. This is why we are exhorted to engage in the good fight of faith. And it is, it is a good fight. It's a fight, but it's a good one. It, 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 that's why we're encouraged to lay hold on eternal life. Because it must be laid hold on. You're not going to get it just by a, a light grasp. To be rooted and grounded, established in the faith. We're exhorted to press in towards the mark. To, to obtain that prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The gospel that draws us and changes us when we respond in faith to it also sustains us as we walk by faith according to it. The same God and the same Lord Jesus Christ who rescued us from the clutches of the devil is the one who continues to deliver us from evil. That's why we can say, as he did in Philippians 1, 6, that we are confident of this very thing, that he that has begun a good work in us is able. He will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. That is your confidence that you have in him, that the same God who, who redeemed you is the God who will sanctify you until the end. The same spirit which convinced you of sin continues in, in, in you to work in you to sanctify your heart and your mind for the work that lies ahead. 
Now, the truth is that as long as we are in the world, we are continuing to be saved by the truth. The gospel, that the message that is declared to us in the gospel continues to be the thing that our, our, our hearts and our minds are rooted in. Now, that being said, the apostle gives them, continues by giving them a brief summary of what this message was, what this message involved that he preached. He said, for I delivered unto you, this is what I preached to you, this is what you first took hold of that changed your life. That, all, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, if you were to ask a great many uh, professing Christians of our day, what is the gospel? What does it mean? You know, what, of what does this gospel testify? I think generally... You would hear something about the death of Christ, that he, he died for us on our, on our behalf. You might even hear about him taking away our sins. I, I don't know about the rest of your experience, but my experience with a lot of, a lot of churches, that's where it ends. You, know, you don't ever hear anything beyond that. And praise God, Jesus dying on our behalf and burying in his body in the tree the iniquities of us all, paying for the sin debt of all humanity, is a very vital part of this message. That has to be preached. There's no mistake about that. But it is if it's not paired with this knowledge of his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension, it's really not a communication of what the scripture declares the gospel to be. The good news is not just that you are taken, that, that your sins are forgiven. It's not just that you have a clean slate before God and you're made righteous in his eyes, but that your sins have been taken away so that you might come to God. You've been freed from your death and from your sins so that you could be alive and holy with him. So that you can participate in the very resurrection life of Jesus Christ himself. That is a high calling. That is the true gospel. We have given our very lives in pursuit of these great and precious promises. It's, it's worth giving ourselves to because we're, we're not just talking about a, a, a halfway thing. Our benefit is only realized as we become associated with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Now, I think that needs to be clarified in our day a lot, that our life now is the life of Jesus we have eternal life because he lives. In the sixth chapter of Romans, he, he, uh, he clarifies this. You know, do, do you not know that those of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We're actually made a, a, an association with his death. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism into death. Why? Why are we buried with him? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And I love the language in this fifth verse here. He he's talking about the divine purpose and intention behind this. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. Now what do you plant something for? What is the purpose of planting something? So that you can have something come up from that planting. We've been planted together in the likeness of his death so that we might also be in the likeness of the resurrection so that fruit would be brought forth unto God. So this vital point is the one which Paul seeks to clarify in their understanding. You know, he, he goes on in the rest of the chapter to address some very serious thoughts that they had about the resurrection that were wrong. This is our hope. This is our very hope in the life of Jesus. The gospel is good news to us as the bride of Christ, his church, because it testifies to us of a living Savior. It testifies to us of a man in heaven who is our representative. It testifies to us of an intercessor at the right hand of God, of a merciful and a faithful high priest in, God, in, in heaven. In things concerning God, the good news is that our lives are hid with Christ in God. That is, they are sure. The hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus is as solid and unchanging as the nature of that life in Christ himself. The life of Jesus is our guarantee of eternal life. This is a vital, important point. This is our hope. This is our joy and our rejoicing, what we are living in earnest expectation of, a continued increasing fellowship with the very life of Jesus Christ that will culminate in the ages to come. And the point of all of these things is, is to glorify God in this. 
So this, this morning, brethren, I want to join in the heart's desire of the Apostle Paul today in delivering this word to you as the church who's being built up as a habitation of God through the Spirit. I declare unto you this gospel which you have believed. Remember the confidence, the surety, and the determination of your entering into that hope. Remember that. That you are in, are in now and standing by the things which you have heard. May we never lose sight of the blessedness of this work. May this never become a common thing to us. That this is indeed the good news of the best kind. This is really the only really relevant message. So, uh, brother, I, I pray that this week as we continue on in this, that our, 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 we will increase in our app apprehension of that implications of this gospel. We'll be able to see more fully how good this good news really is.